So electrolysis, in this chapter, we're going to understand that which liquids are capable of conducting electricity. And from there onwards, we'll understand what differences does electricity or what effects can electricity bring about in a liquid. Now, uh, you may be familiar that uh, we have been using the words like conductor and insulator before. And I hope you already know what these words means. I mean, yeah. we use the word conductor when a solid is capable of conducting electricity. Yeah. Right? So yes. uh, let me tell you, this is purely for solids. Though we have been generically using the words for all states of matters, uh, but uh, to be honest in chemistry, this is uh, more about solids. So if it is capable, we call it a conductor. If it's incapable of conducting electricity, we call it an insulator, right? That's the difference yeah. of what we have been doing. Now, one thing you already know that in case of solids, usually there are some charged particles that must be free to move and they carry the charge. Most of the times, yeah. those are either electrons or sometimes those are either ions that can carry the charge, move from one place to another. And we say that uh, the, the material or the substance is capable of conducting electricity. But when it comes to liquid, it's a little different. So let's talk about those. I'm not talking about the difference in electricity, electrons and ions being capable to move. This remains the same, but we have different words. Now, when we talk about metals, metals are made up of positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. Now, metals conduct electricity because those delocalized electrons are free to move. Remember that structure? Yeah. Good. Good. So, when we talk about ionic compounds, now, in case of ionic compounds, it was a little different. We used to uh, bifurcate ionic compounds into uh, three ways. When the ionic compounds were in solid form, we called them pure insulators. They weren't able to conduct electricity. When they were in molten form, and molten was actually their liquid form, both means the same thing, they were actually good conductors, right? We're going to discuss why they were so. And when they were in their aqueous forms, again, they were good conductors. Now, yeah. we need to mention why that happens. Now, substances such as sodium chloride, since that's an example of an ionic compound, or potassium iodide, they do not conduct ion, electricity ion. when they are solid, right? Yeah. Because the ions are held tightly in position in lattice. Ions are not even able to move. They can only vibrate. Okay. So they are insulators okay. in that case. They can conduct mm -hmm. electricity when they are molten, and when they are dissolved in water, this happens because the ions are then free to move around. So when they're in liquid, mm -hmm. the ions are free to move. When they're in aqueous forms, the, again, the ions are free to move. In both the cases, they are known as conductors. Now, it's better not to use the word conductor. Instead, uh, we can use another term, which we are going to use in this chapter, and that term would be Electrolytes. Electrolyte terms specifically refer to the liquids or the solutions that are able to conduct electricity. So we have a different word for solids and we have different words for liquids or solutions. All right. Don't forget that ionic compounds are made up of positive and negative ions. So we also call cations as positive ions and anions as negative ions. And those ions, since they are able to move freely in both liquid and aqueous systems are able to carry the charge and hence they act as conductors. It's just that we're going to use a new name for it. All right? Um, yeah, um, wait, can I write this down for a second? Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to clear it up and let's see what we have next. Covalent compounds. Now, in case of covalent compounds, we know something for sure that they do not conduct electricity. They do not conduct electricity in any state or in solution form. So 
they do not conduct electricity. They do not conduct electricity in any state. They do not conduct this electricity in solution form, solid form, liquid form. That's because they consist of individual molecules. They don't have any okay. electric charge in them. There are no charged particles to move around. There are no electrons to move around freely. The electrons are tightly held in covalent bonds since covalent bonds themselves are made up of sharing of electrons. So they're not able to move. So yeah, okay. what happens is that they cannot conduct electricity whatsoever. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, but we can come up with some exceptions. For example, I, covalent compounds that can form ions when they react with water, for example, ammonia. Ammonia can react with water and it can form ions. Those ions are then free to move. Okay. For example, hydrogen chloride is a gas. When dissolved in water, it is capable of converting into ions, positive ions and negative ions. Those ions are then free to move. So these are going to be the some examples, some exceptions to these rules. Though most of the covalent compounds are not able to conduct electricity, but some of them react a little differently with water and are capable of producing ions. And of course, if they are in an aqueous solution and they are producing ions, which means ions are free to move. And if ions are free to move, we're going to apply the same strategy. And of course, they would be able to carry the charge carry the current and we'll call them then conductors. These solutions okay. are then also known as electrolytes. So these are known as electrolyte solutions. Right? So electrolyte solution okay. is a solution of a sort that can conduct electricity. Does not matter it forms from a covalent compound or it forms from a dissolving a salt in water, it does not matter. Right, so we're going to keep calling these as electrolyte solution. If any solution can conduct electricity, it's an electrolyte solution. That's an easy definition, yes. right? So, if that yeah. we're good with it, I'm going to clear it up and we're going to move on. Next topic we have is passing electricity through compounds. This is known as electrolysis. So, what exactly is electrolysis? When metal conduct electricity, you will not notice anything happening in them. Metal get a little bit hot, that's about it. When you stop passing the electricity, they again cool down. You don't happen to see any chemical changes occurring in them. When you pass electricity through any compounds, either when they're melted to become a liquid or they are dissolved in water to form a solution, a chemical reaction occurs. So if a chemical reaction occurs when passing electricity through a compound, we call that specific reaction as electrolysis. So electrolysis is a chemical change caused by passing an electric current through a compound, which is either molten or in solution form, and that chemical change occurs, all right? So what kind of chemical change occurs? So first, what we're going to do is that we're going to go through some important words that we'll use during these definitions and these processes. Once we are done with these words, we're going to tell you what kind of change occurs during electrolysis. So let's go through those words. The first one is the one I have been using currently. Electrolyte is actually a liquid or a solution okay. that can undergo electrolysis, which means Whenever we are going to pass electricity through it, electric current through it, the, it would bring about a chemical change. So probably electrolytes contain ions. Those ions are responsible for the conduction of electricity. And again, then again, those ions are the ones that bring chemical change that uh, takes place during the passing of that electric current. All right. So electrolyte yes. is the first important word that we are supposed to know. Secondly, in order to pass electric current through a substance, what we do is that we use car rods. We use metal rods. We can use carbon rods. These rods are commonly known as electrodes. What we do is yes. that we take up a container. We fill that container up with that liquid or solution through which we want to pass electricity. 
we dip these rods and we call these rods as electrodes. Electrodes yeah, mean the one. rods that can pass electricity. If you have performed it, you definitely know. And these rods yeah. are then actually connected to a battery source, right? Um, you, I hope you yeah. understand from physics that we can draw a uh, cell or a battery like this. You draw a cell yeah. like this, right? And if you draw too many cells together, it is known as a battery. Now, I hope yeah. you know from physics that the bigger side that we draw acts as positive and the smaller side that we draw acts as negative okay. side. So yeah. this one's the positive side, this one's the negative side, all right? Yeah. So of course, if this one's the positive and this one's the negative side, this one, this electrode would be the positive electrode, right? And then the other one would definitely be the negative electrode. I hope that makes sense, yeah. right? There yes. would be a diagram yeah. on the next page, the same diagram, the one uh, I'm drawing right now. Yeah, I know. Uh, you, uh, we've done this in school, actually. It's just I don't understand it at all. That's why I'm going through it. So. No problem. Uh, we'll do. Uh, we'll also go through the parts that you find difficult. No problem. All right. Carbon is probably used for electrodes. Uh, I would rather say instead of just going with the word carbon, let's be a little specific. Carbon in the form of graphite is actually used as electrodes. That's the only non-metal substance which can, can conduct electricity. All right. This is an exception among non-metals which is able to conduct electricity. I hope you are familiar with the basics of metals and non-metals. All metals can conduct electricity, but none of the non-metals can conduct electricity. But there is one exception of, among non-metals, and that's graphite. That's the form of carbon, which we commonly use to form electrodes. It can conduct electricity. It is fairly inert. It does not react with most of the substances. So it is a really good substance for making electrodes. Another substance, a metal, platinum, is also fairly inert which means it's unreactive. It does not react with most of the substances. Platinum does not react with most of the acids, most of the alkalis, most of the ion, uh, oxidizing and reducing agents. So it's a really unreactive substance. It can also be used instead of carbon, but there is a problem with platinum that platinum is extremely expensive. Even the smallest, uh, plates or rods, electrodes that we make out of platinum cost us in big. So usually we do not use platinum. Instead, we use graphite. Graphite, on the other hand, is pretty inexpensive. Now, the positive electrode has another name, anode. So this one would be named as anode. And a negative electrode is also named as cathode, right? So they have given yeah. you a hint to remember it, panic. Positive anode, negative cathode, right? So it's an easier hint. It's an easier way to remember it. So I'm gonna yeah. raise it, move on, and you can see the whole thing over here. Now, yeah. uh, not just this diagram, we're actually carrying out an electrolysis of a molten substances, which also gives you the idea that we start off with molten substances. Now, before we start off, I'm actually gonna bifurcate the whole thing for you. Let me tell you, in your book, you are going to carry out electrolysis of four types. Number one, you'll be carrying out electrolysis on molten ionic compounds. All right. And then number two, you'll be carrying out electrolysis on solutions of ionic compounds. My bad not spelled correctly, there you go. So the second one we're going to do is solution of organic compounds. The third one we're going to do uh, is solutions of acids. So we're not gonna do it in that much detail, but a little bit of it would be enough for your slavers. And lastly, solutions of alkalis. So that's about it. These are all what we are going to do in in this chapter. Now, I hope you understand that this is the only one in which we take the examples of molten. And all three of these are actually the examples of solutions, as you can see that written 
in the start of every point solution 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 right uh wait hold um can you repeat that again i didn't really get it i didn't understand sorry so this is the only type which is molten all these types okay. of solution types as you can see the same thing is written over here solutions of ionic compounds yeah. solutions of acids solutions of alkali when i use the word solution i'm actually talking about aqueous solutions only all right so what your book does is that they jump right off with the first one so electrolysis of molten compounds is actually electrolysis of molten ionic compounds and this is the example of the first ionic compound to start with led to bromide okay 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 so yeah what do we do we take the same kind of container or beaker we fill it up with a molten lead to bromide the electrolyte of course it requires heat to, to keep it in the molten state if we do not keep heating it up it may it may solidify and once it becomes a solid it won't be able to conduct electricity so that's why heat is important right we set up the carbon yeah. electrodes we connect them with the help of wires to a dc power supply one to the positive end one to the negative end and from the negative end we also put up a bulb in the circuit i hope you understand from physics that we represent a bulb with a circle and a cross in it yeah. right so yeah. that's a part of physics yeah. we use these yeah. uh, things in the electricity of chapter of physics where we represent yeah, different I'm, parts I'm of circuit right with different great great so you already understand that now the power supply yeah. can be a 6 volt battery it can be a power pack it doesn't matter which one we are using the voltage is not critical either and as soon as is you turn it on now if you don't turn it on there's nothing going to happen when you turn it on okay. uh, then the bulb lights up it shows that the mm -hmm. electrons are flowing through it no mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. bubbling start i'm going to show you another picture so i'm going to raise these up and okay. you're going to see this kind of picture all right so when the electrolysis has started what happens is that mm -hmm. you are going to see some gas bubbles at the anode right this is the positive electrode yeah, yeah. and remember we have positive. been saying that positive electrode is anode all right so anode, around yeah. anode you are going to see uh, bubbles of a gas and since bromine gas has a specific appearance not to forget we told you that bromine is a red brown gas right so you would see a colored yeah. gas around this electrode around the other electrode you'd see some molten lead coming out of it and you'd see it settling down at the bottom since lead is a heavy metal instead of dissolving in water it settles down at the bottom so the same thing the things are written over here there is bubbling around the anode that's the positive terminal of the power source we see red brown or brown bromine gas given off nothing seems to be happening at the electrode connected to the negative terminal but afterwards some metallic lead is found underneath it since that's still just a solid coming out of it so we won't we aren't able to see any changes but at the end of the experiment we do find some deposits settling down at the bottom when you stop okay. heating the lead to bromide solidifies again everything stops because the solid lead to bromide does not conduct electricity so there is no more bubbling and the bulb also uh, goes out right the yeah. bulb which was previously lit because we were able to conduct the electricity experiment electrolysis uh, it would go out now the yeah. lit bulb represents the electrolysis currently going on the reaction going on and when the bulb goes out you know that the reaction has stopped reaction can stop by many reasons you may, might have switched off the battery maybe the circuit is broken or maybe the solution has been solidified or maybe all of the reaction has been completed and the substance is converted remember this the bulb also goes out if this liquid level drops the down below the if the liquid is not touching the rods it won't conduct electricity since the circuit won't be complete let me show you a diagram of this so if there is a liquid level like this and we have rods reaching right here but not touching the liquid level the bulb would go out right so the bulb won't light yeah. up in this case since 
the circuit is complete from the outer end, but the circuit is not complete from this end. These two need to touch one another, or these two need to uh, be able to conduct to one another. At one end, they are, but on the second end, they are. So since the circuit okay. is not complete, the bulb won't light up. This is another case, the bulb won't light up. The cases have been discussed in past papers, so should, you should know about all the cases. All right? Yeah, I'm just writing one note down. Yeah, okay. Can I repeat those cases if you're writing them down? Um, so I said the first one was if we turn off the battery. Yeah, yeah. I said the I know, second no, no. one is if the circuit is not complete because level is either low. Yes. Or the reaction has completed. I said the third one is if the system solidifies again. Yeah, yeah, I already with those, yeah. Good, good, great. So let's clear it up, let's move on. So we need to explain the chemistry behind it. Now, everything that we explained above are the observations. Now, uh, you need to be very clear what you're supposed to write when a question comes in front of you. Now, the examiner may ask about the simple parts of the apparatus. The examiner may ask about your observation. These are the observations. What do you see happening when you are conduct, uh, conducting the whole experiment? Is the bulb lighting up? Does the bulb go out? Are there any gas bubbles? Is the gas colored or colorless? Do you see anything happening on the anode or do you see anything happening to the cathode? Uh, is the liquid in the molten form or has that solidified into a solid again? These are all observations. But this is what you can see in front of you. In the background, there is an entire chemistry going on which we need to explain and which we are going to explain in these paragraphs. Now, we are yeah. properly going to explain these in terms of both theory and reactions. And the students in Edexcel are supposed to know both the theory answers as well as writing the reaction. So I'm gonna start with the theory yeah. first. Now, to begin with, you the, already know uh, that can, can you repeat uh, the word again? The the what? The ionic compounds I, led to bromide is an ionic compound. No, no, I meant uh, you were saying you were saying that we uh, there's two there's like there's the reactions that the students need to know of and the there's something else. This theory. I was saying the theory. Theory. theory the yeah. process behind it, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. To begin with the theory, this one uh, means the details. You know, led to bromide is an ionic compound. Now this is a solid. This consists of a giant structure, and the structure is made up of positive ions. Those are of lead. Negative ions, those are bromide ions. And they are packed regularly in an alternate arrangement in the crystal lattice. Now, yes. the ions are locked tightly in the lattice. They can vibrate, but they aren't allowed to leave their fixed positions. So they aren't free to move. All right? So if they aren't free to move, they won't be able to conduct electricity. As simple as that. But once they start melting down, the ions become free to move around. And once they are free to move around, they start conducting electricity. Now, how are they able to conduct electricity? Let's understand the truths. Now, the power source actually pumps mobile electrons away from the left-hand electrode towards the right-hand one. You need to understand it. Let me draw it for you since the word seems yeah, a little difficult. So this is our power source. Now you understand this is the negative side, this is the positive side, all right? So this yeah. is the left side, this is the right one according to them. And okay, so bulb, and then they are connected to the electrodes after. Both electrodes are at the same level, but I've just drawn it like this, all right? So yeah. what we're trying to say is that the it pumps electrons through this, right? And electrons go from left-hand electrodes to the right-hand one, all right? So actually, yeah, kind of. the, these go all the way over here, and that's why they are yeah. able to shift from positive to negative. 
yes. when i start drawing from this side it sometimes confuses the students that they say the left hand electrode is positive and the right hand electrode is negative so they are saying it goes to, from the left hand side towards the right hand side so actually this is the whole circuit and of course it is uh, going okay. to go from this side all the way to this one uh, yes all right so that's yeah. how it, the electrons keep moving through the circuit and that occurs due to the presence of the battery batteries are power source and uh, like any other electrical power source it can send out mobile electrons from one side and can receive those electrons from the other all right this means yes, there are extra electrons at the right hand side there are some electro electrons uh, extra electrons <laughs> sorry about that extra electrons yeah. at the right hand side now uh, it is negative since there are some extra electrons which start moving from this side go all the way to this side so there are some extra electrons over here yes all right okay so the positive yeah. lead to ions in the molten uh, lead to bromide are attracted to the negative electrode now i am going to draw the whole diagram over here not just the small part since you might not be able to understand okay so let's draw the electrodes properly let's draw the solution properly show them they are depth, that they are dipped in the solution let's draw the battery properly let's connect the bulb in the same line and let's connect it this part so this part's negative this part's positive this part's negative now you'd see okay so we said that the, there are some extra electrons on b side and they start moving from here all the way to this electrode and since this is the negative side this one becomes the negative electrode and the solution now has some lead to ions and the solution now has some bromide ions now yeah. since this is the negative electrode it's pretty understandable that a positive ion will get attracted toward it yes okay so as soon as some extra electrons are pushed out of the battery they move and they come to this electrode the positive ions get attracted to them not so much so that they ion, these ions move and come and get deposited over here not just that yeah. they receive those electrons and are neutralized into atoms the ion is converted into a neutral atom they pick okay. those two electrons up every lead ion since it has a charge of positive 2 it can pick up two electrons and it can become a neutral atom as soon as it becomes a neutral atom it does not get attracted to this electrode anymore it falls down okay since it's also heavy if it this also falls down it because it's heavy if you find uh, try to find lead in the periodic table you'll find it at the bottom of the periodic table and elements at the bottom of the periodic table are the heavier ones so of course it's going to fall uh, down can you repeat the sentence where you said the reason it falls down other than other than it being heavy there was one more reason they stated uh other than it being heavy first it was an ion it was positively charged it was getting yes. attracted to this electrode because this electrode had some extra electrons mm. right yes. electron has a negative yeah. charge one has a positive charge of course there is going to be some attraction as yes. shown in this diagram as well right yeah. but as soon yes. as it becomes a neutral atom it falls down there is no attraction anymore remember only positive attracts negative right neutral does not yeah. attract negative so the neutral falls down Yes. so the yeah. same thing is shown over here this is actually a, a expanded diagram of just the negative electrode what's happening to lead at the negative electrode yeah we call this equation as a half equation because it's only yeah. okay. showing us one half of the diagram it's only talking about the lead electrons we don't or can't understand anything related to bromide ions in this equation so we call it a half equation there um, is another yeah, reason um, why we call it a half equation i mean to consider that mm -hmm. by moving further down the detail yeah you were about to ask something yeah we did have equations in school but i didn't know how to solve them most of the time or especially when it came to 
they already gave the result like they would give um br or c c or something and then you had to make it equal to something and i didn't really understand how to do it so yeah sure that's what i'm going to explain as soon as we're done with what's happening over here we're done with all of the theory and i'm going to practice a few questions with few different substances you should be capable of writing the questions on your own if it's not lead. What if it's not lead? What if it's calcium? What if it's sodium? What if it's aluminum? How are you going to write it? I'm going to make sure of that. But let's just finish the theory over here and I'm going to come with other examples right after it, all right? And I will make sure that if they come up with a different substance for electrolysis, you know, you should know what to do, okay? So, and that includes writing of equations, of course. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next paragraph. Right after the equation, the power source pumps new electrons along the wire to replace the electrons that have been removed from the cathode just because they were added to some lead ions. That's what the power source is for. So that's just one half of what's occurring. All of this, what we have discussed over here, is mostly about lead ions. Yeah. We don't know yeah. what happened to bromide ions. So let's start discussing about bromide ions now. Okay. Now, bromide yeah. ions are negatively charged. They're not going to get attracted to the negative electrode. They're going to get attracted towards the positive electrode, positive. the opposite yeah. one, right? The anode. Yes. So when they yeah. get to the positive electrode, they have some extra electrons, which what they do, they throw out those extra electrons. This since bromide ions is negatively charged, they move on to the electrode and mm, that electrode yeah. is short of electrons. So yeah. actually the electrode is capable of taking the electrons out of bromide. You can say it like that, right? Okay. So what happens, yeah. I'm gonna move on. Let me raise a few parts so that they don't really. Okay, so we're gonna keep the diagram, okay. So what happens, the loss of the extra electrons convert each bromide ion into a bromine atom. And that's how it happens. The bromide ion becomes a bromine atom, it loses an electron. But this one was pretty simple. This one isn't going to be as simple. Bromide is very reactive in its atomic form. It quickly reacts with another bromine atom and forms a bromine molecule through a single covalent bond that we have studied in the previous bonding chapter, that yes. almost all the halogens quickly react with one another and form molecules with single uh, covalent bond, right? So the same thing is uh, carried out by bromine or chlorine or fluorine or iodine, all the group seven members, right? You'd yes. see, you'd notice the same equation on the next page. They join in pairs and they form molecules. So what we do, instead of writing two separate equations, we just write one equation. We show that two bromide ions form a bromine molecule by giving away one electron each, a total of two electrons. That's the way we write it. We call it an overall equation. Okay. And that's what's happening at the positive electrode. In case of positive electrode, the positive electrode is filled with positive charge. It has very less uh, these red particles and electrons. So what happens is that um, bromide ions are getting attracted to it. And in order to balance the whole electrode, they start losing their electrons to this electrode. Once that happens, the bromine, bromide ions become bromine atoms. Then bromine atoms okay. start bonding one another with one another in pairs, as we suggested mm. on the top of this page. Yes. And that's what the brown colored gases, this uh, brown okay. gas. And since gases are usually lighter, they go up. They start diffusing towards uh, the upward direction. They also uh, explained a point back from the bonding chapter that bromine atom has seven electrons in its outer shell, they only need to form a one single covalent bond. They share one electron each, and then they have eight electrons in their outermost shell. That's how they become stable. So their yeah. whole reactivity 
is uh, actually a drive for them to become stable. And that's what these, that's how these molecules form. Okay. Yeah, now, it's really important to use the correct terms when you're talking about the reactions. Bromide yeah. is the name of ions. They are erected to anode. They lose electrons there and they form bromine molecules. So do not confuse bromide or bromine since bromide are ions and bromines are molecules. The ions are attracted okay. to the electrode and they form these molecules over there after losing electrons. Now what happens is that these electrons that they lost, these red colored particles, these new electrons on the electrode flow back into the power source. Since they are attracted by the power source, since this one is connected to a positive side, and this positive side is really deprived of electrons, so it keeps attracting these electrons out of this electrode. Uh, All right. Will, wait, um, there's just one, one point I need to write. That's it. If you don't mind. Okay. Uh, wait, can you can you wait, can you repeat the the key point for the bromine and bromine atom has only seven electrons? means the one that I just said, or about losing yes. of electrons? The losing of electrons. I just okay. need to refresh on that. Okay, I was saying that since this part, this positive electrode is connected to the battery, so the new electrons yeah. in the electrode flow back to the power source. Why? Because yes. the power source at this point is positive. Now it is really yeah. deprived of electrons. What happens is that this positive side uh, actually attracts these electrons and electrons keep moving or flowing back to the source. That's why the circuit is completed. The bulb Understood. lights up, All right? Yeah, I got so it, yep. This was connected to a bulb, right? This was connected to our cathode and this whole thing was connected to a solution in a container, right? So yep. now the circuit is complete. Now, this can conduct electricity from the outer side through the wires and the battery. And from inside, actually, the solution is through conducting ions. Since the bromide ions are getting attracted to this end and the lead ions are getting attracted to this end, so the ions keep moving and keep getting attracted and keep getting the charge to both the electrodes. So we have a complete circuit. Electrons yep. start all the way from here, they keep moving over here, and then the ions carry out the charge in this section, and then the electrons can flow back to the system. Right? Got it. Yep. Yes. And because of this, we can say that this actually is an electrolyte since it's capable of conducting electricity due to the movement of ions, charged particles. Right? Yeah. That's the definition, that's the important words we started off with. Sometimes we talk about ions being discharged at electrode. Discharging an ion means losing its charge. This happens either by giving up electrons to the electrode or receiving electrons from it. We studied both the things. I hope you do understand that giving up the electrons was something that was done by bromide ions. Receiving the electrons was something that was done by lead ions. So yeah, discharging happened at both electrodes. I hope that makes sense, yeah. does it? Yes, it does. Yeah, I got it. Great. So as I've already stated, the key point stays, stays the same, that the external circuit is the wire, the power pack, the bulb, the electrodes. Electrons flow in the external circuit. But what we have on the other end is the electrolyte and ions flow in the electrolyte part. So in the molten or the liquid section, ions are flowing and outside in the wires in the power pack, the electrons are flowing. But both these uh, charged particles, be it electrons or the ions, are actually responsible for the conduction of electricity throughout the whole system. Everyone is playing their own part. I hope that makes sense. Good, yep. good. Maybe it makes sense. 
good with it let's move on yeah now in order to be able to write equations properly and in order to be able to write equations for almost any material that they come up with since lead to bromide is not the only molten system we are going to face in exams we're going to face many examples in exam we need to understand how these reactions work in order to understand how these reactions work the most important definition that we come up with the most important word is redox reactions or if we bifurcate redox into two parts that is actually a combination of oxidation and reduction it's reactions reduction. Yeah. We are going to do that in chapter number 14, but uh, let's describe a little bit of these words so that you can follow what's happening in there. Now, you already are familiar that bromide gave up electrons, right? Yeah. And led to picked up electrons, right, in these reactions. Yeah. When I use the word oxidation and reduction, I'm actually trying to say that oxidation is the reaction when electrons are lost, something loses electrons. So this is oxidation. Oxidation is actually yes. something which occurred to bromide ions. And on the other hand, reduction occurs when something gains electrons. So this is reduction. So reduction occurred to the lead ions in the previous example. So simply shorten this to oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. We actually try to remember it with the word oil ring. That's a very easy mnemonic. I can previously can we were talking about. Yeah, you can, sure. So previously we talked about the mnemonic panic in order to remember the positive electrode was anode and the negative electrode is cathode. Oil ring is another very good mnemonic. It helps us to remember that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. Um, there's only so, one point I'm really confused in. There's um, obviously there's oxidation and reduction, but the, we also use the words oxidate, oxidizing agent and reduct like a reducing agent, but it's always the opposite. Like something that's like um, something that has been oxidized is usually the reducing agent. Yeah, which yeah, I don't really that's get. That's the difference. Uh, I'm going to come next to it. I'm going to talk about oxidizing and reducing agents right after we're done with oxidation and induction. And I'll also give you an easier way to remember it. Like we are using the mnemonics over here. I'm going to give you an example to be easily be able to bifurcate between oxidizing and reducing agents since they come a little confusing when they're compared with these two words, oxidation and reduction. So I'll give you a couple of easier methods to remember that. I'll also explain uh, how they're opposite to one another and how that works. But let's go with the uh, pattern of the book. And as soon as we get to that point, I'll definitely explain it. All right, so I'm just gonna keep your question pending for a little while and I'm gonna explain it as soon as we get there, if that's fine with you. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Sorry, good, okay, I good. just picked up something. Okay. If you're done writing, can we move on? Um, just one one more line, that's it, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. take okay, your time, done, that's fine. Done, done. Good, good, okay. So if we look at it again, lead were the ones that took up electrons and we call this a gain in electrons, we call this reduction, so, what you are supposed to write in exams is this, lead ions are reduced to lead atoms. Now, you should be familiar with these terms. If there is a charge on top, we're going to call it an ion. The ion is reduced if it gains electrons to atoms. Why? Because this one's neutral. This one has no charge. There's nothing written on top of it, right? So yep. on the other hand, bromide ions, Lose, lost electrons and loss of electron is oxidation. So we can safely say bromide ions are oxidized to bromine molecules since these are bromine molecules. So that's uh, how we are supposed to uh, convert these equations into words, into sentences. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 these are the points you have to write in the exam question paper when they ask, give you, right? Right, right. 
yeah. and examiners yeah. specifically try to see whether the student is able to convert these into the proper scientific terminologies. So writing style like lead ions, lead two ions, or reduced lead atoms is uh, an, the best way to express it in words. So instead of using your own words, take these words right out of the book. I always ask my students to take these words right out of the book since that's the best way to describe it. Right? So moving on. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye -bye. If something loses electrons, something else must gain electrons. So oxidation and reduction occur simultaneously at the same time. That's why we use the word redox. Redox is actually red comes from reduction. Ox comes from oxidation, so redox. So the reaction yeah, that go gone with electrodes, each equation shows only one of the processes. So we mm -hmm. call them half equations. I told you there is one more reason why we call them half equations. This is the main yeah. reason. We call them half because they're mm -hmm. showing only one of these mm -hmm. processes at a time. If one of these equations is showing you oxidation, the other one must be showing you reduction or vice versa. So we call them ionic half equations since they are composed of ions. And these ionic half equations is something that you're asked to write representing the reactions <laughs> at lick force. Now, this should be the right time where we discuss different examples, okay? Now, it can be really easy if you look at it. Now, every ionic compound, and I'm going to break it down to you in simpler words. So every ionic compound is made up of a positive ion, right, and a negative ion. Yeah. Okay. And the positive ion is usually made up of a metal. And a negative ion is usually made up of a non-metal. Non-metal, yeah. Right? So... Yes. What happens is that you'd see that the positive metal ions most of the time will uh, gain electrons, right? Like this one did. Yeah. Or the negative non-metal ions would usually lose electrons. This would usually happen at cathode. This would usually happen at anode. Gain of electrons yeah. is commonly known as reduction. Mm -hmm. And loss of electron is commonly known as oxidation. So these are the facts which actually stay the same for any kind of molten electrolysis, be it any compound on the planet. So what are you supposed to do? you're supposed to bifurcate any written compound. Let's say you are going to face this compound next. So this is the positive ion. You already know that this is a positive ion. You already don't know this is a negative ion, right? Yeah. So you need to yeah. break them down. This is a positive ion. Huh? And what's going to happen is that it's going to gain electron. And that's gonna happen at cathode. And we're gonna call it reduction. This is a negative ion. This is going to gain electrons. That's gonna happen at anode, and we're gonna call it oxidation. Understood. Now, the question is, the most common questions that students ask me is how would we know how many electrons it's going to gain or lose? Because yeah, no, it's not gonna... like every time uh, it gains one electron or it gains two or it gains three. Oh, yeah. In different cases, it's different. And you must have the same question in mind, right? So it's yeah. really easy when it comes to that. Take a look at the metal. If it is plus one or plus simply, it's going to gain one electron. If it's plus two, it's pretty easy. It's going to gain two electrons. If it's plus three, it's going to gain three electrons. That's how easy it is. And then it becomes a neutral atom. Yep, understood, yeah. Right. Wait, can you no. uh, can you sort of kind of repeat it again, like then to make me understand it? Bit. Like, so it gets uh, like a second yeah. Do you want me to repeat this one or this one? The one on the left or the one on the right? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the one on the right. 
the one on the right. Yes, this one. Yes. So I was saying if the charge is plus one, right? So yeah. if it has just one on it, plus one on top of it, it's only gonna gain one electron. Yeah. If the charge is plus two, it's gonna gain two electrons. If the charge is plus three, it's gonna gain three electrons. Right? Mm -hmm. It's Understood. that yeah. simple it is. Now, yeah. sometimes right. students also tend to ask me the question, how would we know what charge it has? Yes, yes. Now, that's the question we studied back in the periodic tables chapter. And if you don't remember, let me just quickly joggle your memory. Don't forget in periodic table, group one always has the charge of plus one. So any element from group one, be it sodium, be it potassium, be it rubidium, be it cesium, be it any other element from the same group will always has the charge of plus one, right? Yep, understood. If anything from group two, it would have the charge of plus two. Anything from group yep. three will have the charge of plus three. So it's that easy it is. So actually sodium belongs to group one and aluminum belongs to group three. That's why it has plus one charge or it has plus three charge, right? Yep. So for something, lead is not present in group two. How would we know lead has a charge of plus two? So for that kind um, of system, which you cannot find in the groups of the periodic table, there is another way to do it. Take a look at the whole formula. Lead bromide has this formula. Let me tell you this formula came into being after we followed these steps. I hope you understand that if lead has a plus two charge and bromine has yes. a negative charge, negative we actually charge, yeah. cross multiply them at their bottoms, mm -hmm. at the subscript portions without the charge. So that's how we write it. Lead was written as one and bromine, bromine was written as two. Since we don't mention ones, it became PBBR2. So it became this. So this came into yeah. being only when this two was actually a part of plus two charge over here and says there's nothing written over here, this means here it was negative one, right? So we can yes, reverse cross multiply them. This was the method to form a formula. This is the method of reverse multiplying, cross multiplying to break down a formula into the ions. So yeah, if you can't find it in group one, two or three, you must need to go with this process in order to get the numbers. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. Good, good. So now you know how you're supposed to write equations and now you know how to break them down to get their charges. But you've only written the equations for positive ions or metals. You know how yeah. to write the reduction half equations. We haven't explained yeah. the oxidation half equations. So I'm going to erase these. Can I erase these if you're done writing? Yes, I'm done. Okay. So I'm gonna raise these and we're gonna go with the non-metals. How we are we going to work out the non-metals? Now in most of the non-metal cases, there is a problem that their atoms tend to react with one another. Uh, I hope okay. you remember, we said that bromine loses its only electron forms a bromine atom like this, but there is a problem since one bromine atom pairs up with another one through a single covalent bond and forms this, so what we did is that we combined these two equations into a single one. We said two bromide ions would become a bromine molecule directly by losing two electrons as a whole. Means one bromide is losing one electron. That's how we wrote it. So we're gonna yes. use the same pattern. So if there are chloride ions, how are we gonna write it? It's like this. Right, e but plus, since yeah. we are supposed to write a two over here, since it forms a molecule, so we're gonna write a two mm -hmm. over here and a two over here to balance the equation. Yeah. Since if there are two chloride ions, only then they can form a chlorine molecule consisting of two atoms, and of course losing two electrons, one from each ion. Yeah. It becomes a little bit difficult when we are handling stuff like oxygen, since oxide ion has negative two charge. Okay, now oxygen is also going to lose electrons, 
One oxide ion has two extra electrons, so it's going to happen like this. But since it's going to form an oxygen molecule, so we are supposed to write two over here. But yeah. one oxygen oxide ion loses two electrons, so two are going to lose a total of four. So that's how oh, yeah. we write it. So I'm going to erase yes. it and I'm going to write two over here. So you have the exact equation. Sorry, four over here. Make sense? Yeah. Make sense. Okay. Yeah. So that's it for the non metals. The yeah. most non metals are either halogens, bromine, fluoride, bromide ions, fluoride ions, iodide ions. Sometimes we deal with the oxide ions. Yeah. Right? There are yeah, other ions as yeah. well, but once we face them, I'll also tell you, but I've seen those ions pretty rare in an Excel exams. The most ones you face are the ones that I've just told you about. Bromide ions, chloride ions, iodide ions, or oxide ions. That's about it. Right? And you already yes, know I'm... about these. If you're writing them yep. down, make sure to wind it up. Okay. Then yeah. writing? Yes. Good, uh, I, good. I... So what I was trying to say over here is that, again, if it has a negative one charge, it will lose one electron. But since they pair up, we need to write them as two. If there is a negative yes. two, two charge, it's going to lose two electrons. But since they pair up, the total would be four. So this is yeah, simple understand. mathematics that we need to understand. And I hope you've already yeah. understood it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, great. So now you know the whole breakdown of an ionic compound into positive and negative ions, and what's going to happen to each kind of ion. Yeah. Um, next, wait, next time we uh, do the, uh, this again, um, there was a, there's a specific, uh, wait, hold on, let me get the name, just one second. You sure? Take your time. Um, we also did electroplating, and that's also one thing I have to understand. Yeah, uh, electroplating. Uh, electrolysis is actually, of aluminium. Um, as well. Yeah, all right. Electrolysis of aluminium is right over here on the very next page. Yeah. And then after we're done with most of the electrolysis, I guess electroplating is the last part of this chapter. And there is some quantitative electrolysis. There's electroplating. I guess it was here somewhere, but even if the electroplating is not here, we can always do it. Let me see. I remember teaching electroplating to some previous students. Uh -uh. It's not over here. That's a little astonishing. Okay, let me just look for it. This is for the um, electrolysis. Well, even if it's not present over here, we can always go to that topic. That's not a problem. We have, I do have other sources to cover those topics up, right? And if it's a part of your book, I'll find out which chapter it is in and we'll cover that. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So since it's about time, let 